The Dewcast. People doing the thinkable. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the DoCast. I want to thank you for joining me today. My name is Richard Hanley. I started up a food company about a year ago and a blog where I try to document all my experiments. The DoCast is a podcast where about once or twice a month I get together with amazing people who inspire me and talk about how they get started, where they're going, and how you can learn from them, the doers of the world. And today we have an amazing guest. But before I get there, I'd like to get a hat tip to our sponsor, Hanley's Foods, my company, uh, Louisiana inspired natural fresh food. Uh, currently, we're in the process of making our strawberry vinaigrette, which we are scrambling about how to make it. We think we bit off more than we can chew, but we will make it happen. Uh, we just got a Whole Foods, Fresh Market, and Rouse's, which is the largest grocer in Louisiana. And we do have our salad dressings in all the mom and pop shops throughout South Louisiana and available at Haley'sFoods.com. And just for the listener, you get a coupon code, uh, $4 off your next order by entering in the coupon code DUCAST at checkout. So I'd like to talk a little bit about our guest on the show, Derek Silvers. In the early days, in the early dawn of the internet, it wasn't easy for an independent artist to sell their music online. So Derek decided to create a system that he could. And then his friends and friends of friends wanted to do the same. That's where CD Baby was born. It became a lean sales machine, producing over $100 million in sales and servicing over 200,000 musicians. Derek later sold CD Baby, given portions of the proceeds to charity, in 2008. And he's also a best selling author, musician, programmer, world traveler, and circus ringleader. Today, I have the <laughs> pleasure to speak with him uh, via Skype at his home in New Zealand to talk about marketing automation, and how we can gear that towards product-based companies. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Derek Silvers. How are hey, you, Richard, man? Thank you. <laughs> nice intro. I, I, I love the way at the very beginning how you mentioned the things you're doing as experiments. I'm, I'm the same way. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, avid, viver, avid, what's your, uh, one of your taglines? Avid, vivid learner of life. I love that. Yeah. Avid learner of a life. So uh, take me back real quick with uh, with CD Baby. Growing up, I read a little bit how you were, uh, you never really had a job. You At 14, you started off doing a few things. So uh, if you could just take me a little back, where'd you grow up and how'd you kind of get started? Sure. Um, grew up in Chicago for the most part. And at the age of 14, I decided I wanted to be a musician. And Different people can interpret this differently. I mean, different people can be affected a different way by deciding that, right? So for some people, the life of a musician is just party, party, party. But for me, it was like, if I'm going to be a successful musician, that's like wanting to be an Olympic athlete. It's like this is something mm -hmm. that a million people want and only one in a million gets. Right. So I'm going to need to be the best of the best and it got me really focused. So all of a sudden I, I went from just kind of being a uh, teenager who was just hanging out, doing whatever, into just being really, really focused and being a real workaholic and just practicing all the time. And I started reading all these books about the success mindset and stuff like that because mm. I needed to know the success mindset if I was going to be successful. <laughs> and uh, that really it, – it changed my life. You know, It, it got me onto a real focused track where – People later uh, tell me that I'm so lucky for opportunities I had or whatever, but I think it was just because I was just that guy that never hung out, never watched TV, never um, was just chilling. I was always working, you know, and always learning as much as I could and practicing as much as I could and just really, really focused. So I did have jobs, though. It was kind of fun how you said that I, I never had a job. I don't really talk about it much, mm -hmm. but... I was a long hair musician at 16. It was like the the late 80s metal days. Mm -hmm. And so I had big, long hair. And so the only kind of job I could get was in telemarketing. Where no, yeah, I know. <laughs> now it, I used it all up. Um, but the only job I could get was in telemarketing where nobody cares what you look like, right? So I learned a lot about sales and sales techniques from being like a teenager doing telemarketing 
Um, so I did that for a few years, actually, even when I went off to college, um, I, I still continue to do telemarketing for various companies. What was the product? I'm just curious. Um, the main one, I just realized, I can't even remember what the, the later one I did was, but I think when I was 16, I did a, it was a chimney sweeps business mm. where I grew up in Hinsdale, Illinois. And, uh, they would literally just like open the phone book, they, like the white pages and say, okay, you start on the letter J, well, go. That's interesting. So at, at a young age, you were able to see the non-effective ways of marketing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but then the the great experience was a few months. So I only did the chimney sweep business for a few months. That was no good. But then I got a job at Time Magazine, mm. which was intense because it was like this big sales floor of like 150 employees. And um, I got to listen in. The manager liked me. She thought I was cute. She, I mean, she was you know, 10 years older than me, but um, she thought I was cute. And so I was doing really poorly at first. Um, it was renewing people's subscription to Time Magazine. That's what our floor did. So here's what I used to do. Um, I used to call up people and say, um, hi, my name's Derek from Time Magazine in Chicago. Um, we're wondering if maybe you'd want to renew your script subscription today. <laughs> and people would say, no, I'm not interested. Click. Like, oh, oh, well, maybe I can, yeah, click. Yeah. And I was about to get fired because I was so bad. But because my manager liked me, she said, come here. Like, I don't want them to fire you. Like, the, my manager's told me I need to fire you soon. Um, I don't want you to get fired here. Sit here at my desk, put on these headphones, and listen to what George Amos does. He's the, the top-selling guy on the floor. Mm. So George Amos was this uh, big, intimidating guy that would get on the phone, and he would just steamroll over the customer like this. Uh, they'd pick up the phone, and they'd say, hello, and he'd say, Hey, there, this is George Amos calling from Time Magazine in Chicago. We're just calling to renew your subscription today. I see you've been with us for a few years, and we do appreciate your business. We're going to get you in for a three-year subscription this time <laughs> so that you don't waste money on this year-to-year -year renewal because the year-to-year -year renewal is uh, $54. If we lock you into the three-year renewal, it brings the price down to only $22. It'll save you $75 over the next three years. Can I count you in for that? That's hilarious. And they say, Oh dear, I don't know if I. Oh, that's great. You know, we can just get you in for the three years. Save seventy five dollars. I'll take care of it all right now. You don't need to do a thing. Yeah. And a lot of people would go, okay. <laughs> but then if they said no, like, oh, three years. I don't know. He said, no problem. I understand. Let's just lock you in for the two years. Then you'll still be saving thirty three dollars a year. We'll do that. We'll get you in for two renewal. You'll be all set. You are still at a uh, one twenty three Main Street, right? They'd say, yes, I am. Okay, great. Then how do I get you all set for the two year renewal then? And a lot of people would say yes. And if they still said no a second time, he said, no problem. I totally understand. One year would be fine. Um, we'll get you in for just one more year this time. Um, the address is still correct. Great. Okay. Got you all set for another one year renewal. Thank wow. you so much. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Just relentless. So I yeah. So I went back to my phone and I just started imitating George Amos. They, they, I should look him up. And see him. Um, yeah. So I just started imitating him and it worked. And, uh, Maybe because I was a little less intimidating and a little friendlier voiced, I actually ended up topping George Amos wow. on the sales floor. I became like the top guy at the company. Uh, that was a great experience. I was, whatever, 17 at the time. Yeah. No, and, 16. Wow, 16. And that just kind of showed you, too, is confidence is key and how powerful just being like, you know, in any salesman position, whether it's yours or not, just being completely confident of what you have. You know, people see that and they trust that a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many subtleties about like how many decisions are you putting back on their plate versus just taking care of for them and mm. things like that. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Cool. So, uh, from that to CD baby, what was, what was the transition? Uh, you're a musician, you're still doing your little one-off gigs, right? And, uh, you're just looking for a place to sell your CDs online. Doesn't exist. Right. Yeah. It, it's, Hard to imagine now, but in 2007, the, uh, sorry, I mean 1997, um, the internet was a different place. There, there was no PayPal. Um, there was nothing that would let you accept payments online at all. Uh, if you wanted to have a buy now button, you had to go get a book on CGI bin Perl mm -hmm. programming and, and cut and paste some like 55 line Perl scripts into the CGI bin directory on your Apache web server. And 
uh, set your CH mod permissions correctly, and then you had to contact your bank, get a credit card and merchant account, and uh, and that was like a thousand dollars in setup fees and three months of paperwork. I had to uh, incorporate. I had to get a separate bank account. They had to send an inspector out to my location to make sure I was a valid business. And luckily, I had a little recording studio set up in my home so I could point to my recording studio and say, yes, I'm a valid business. Here's my recording studio. I need a credit card merchant account so I can charge my customers. And so some inspector, you know, ticked the box, said I was a valid business. And only then, after three <laughs> months of work... Did you learn programming too? I had... No, I, I just copied the examples out of the book. Okay. But yeah, I had to go buy a book on CGI bin Pearl programming in order to get the script could let me have a shopping cart or a buy now button on my website. So yeah, it was three months of hard work. But when I was done, I had a buy now button on my website. So you could buy my CD. But uh, it was so hard at the time that once I did that, of course, all my musician friends around New York City said, uh, hey, man, can can you sell my CD too? Mm -hmm. So CD Baby really just grew out of the kind of co-op model of like, mm -hmm. well, here's something I have that my friends need. So I'll just find a way to share it with my friends for a very small fee. And that was how the business created. So at what point, how long did it take to go from that point? So when you had 85 employees and were producing, you had 200,000 musicians, at what point uh, did that happen? And then, so it's, I think it's very interesting is the fact that you had that completely automotive. I don't know if you could speak on that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, growth was very, very, very slow. Um, I just have to laugh when I meet people now who are like, hey, we started this startup three months ago and it's not huge yet. What are we yeah. doing wrong? Yeah. <laughs> like, by three months into my business, I was still building my homepages. I don't know. It's, it, it took CDB about four years to really get off the ground. And I mean from the time I started it. I don't mean four years of sitting on the idea. I went from idea to reality in about one week. I just put up a basic website that was like, click here to buy a CD. And it was just like a simple thing. that It, it did nothing. Like if you would click to buy a CD, it would do nothing but send me an email with the person's credit card info and then I would charge it by hand at home, but I was only getting a few orders a week. So yeah. there was zero automation at first, like literally everything. Like I didn't even have an online database. I only had a little Excel spreadsheet on my computer and, and every person that would email or that would place an order, I would just get an email and I would hand copy and paste their email to fields in the spreadsheet one by one. So that was zero automation, but honestly, mm -hmm. man, like that was enough to get started. Mm -hmm. And I think it's funny when I think what happens a lot now is people get a business idea and they immediately imagine kind of the end game of where it will be years from now. They say, this thing's going to be huge. So we need to have a full like server side database with massive authentication. We got to have this. We got to have a, a, you know, big scalable, massive redundancy, blah, blah, blah. And they're preparing to be huge before there's any proof that anybody cares about their idea. So I think that no what business you're in, you know, we mentioned about how it's different being like an internet thing versus a food startup. Um, but regardless, you can start itty bitty small with no automation at all and then just get started and do lots of stuff by hand. And yes, it's extra work, but it gets you past that biggest hurdle of all, which is getting started. Mm -hmm. And that's how you and start. Once you've kind of. Yeah, exactly. So it's like once you've kind of hung out your shingle, as they say, like you're in business now, somebody can contact you and place an order, no matter how lo-fi it is, you're in business now. And now you can automate based on customer need instead of some kind of vision projection of where you think this will be in a few years. Like mm -hmm. let the customers show you where your automation is needed and what they need and build on that. So yeah, it was it was a, for me for CD Baby. It was a very slow growth. Um, even a year after I started the business, it was a real part time thing. I was still getting maybe a couple orders a day. Uh, one year into it, that's when I had to hire my first employee. Uh, it was after first year, and then it was like full two years in that I had to hire a second employee and slowly start to automate some more things. And it, yeah, it wasn't until the business was about 
four years old that it really started taking off. So at what point when you said your first year you hired your first employee, um, when did you decide that it's time? And I think this is a key where a lot of people struggle. You know, you want to save money, so you, therefore you want to do as many, much everything as you can. But at the same time, it's like, you, you know, you can't work 20-hour days. You know, just by working more hours <laughs> isn't going to make more profits. Uh, so, right. I, like, I'm currently finding that struggle. So it's like, when is a good point to bring on someone? What's, what is what is it that you look for at that time? Well, I really believe in going about as far as you can with your own um, – with your own labor. So I was working practically 20 hour days and to, until to me it was proven that I needed somebody else. Cause I think most startups fail from trying to grow too fast, too early from hiring too many people up front. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And then burning through their budget for something that isn't, that doesn't really have legs yet. So I think it is smart to avoid hiring as long as possible and to only hire when yeah, you get to the point where you are working as efficient as you can 20 hours a day and then yeah it's time to bring on a new person um as far as what to find in a person the biggest thing to me is intrinsic motivation what this means is not just somebody who's doing the job for the money or even somebody who has a lot of experience in the past, but still kind of seems to be doing it for the money. You want to find somebody who is using you as a stepping stone to their own bigger aspiration. Right. Uh, where they where they want this job. Uh, they want to excel in your job for personal reasons, for their own self development, for their own goals. Um, that matters so much more. Like at CD Baby, I would hire musicians only, like people who knew the pain of putting out their own music and had been mm -hmm. sending their music to various magazines or websites or conferences or whatever and being rejected. They knew that pain and they knew the struggle that independent musicians have. And so therefore, if they're working, whether in customer service or even pickpacking and shipping CDs in the warehouse, they came at their job with a sense of purpose. Like I'm going to help other musicians kind of have a better life because I know how hard it is. You know what I mean? That matters right. so much more than just somebody that came in looking for a job. So I think in any field, yeah, you should be looking for the people that want to use you as a stepping stone for their own learning because they're going to come in and have all the motivation in the world to be the best at what they do. Right. So how do you keep those people whenever they, uh, you know, because they're they're So, you know, you've been working with them and they're, they're giving everything that they get. Now their information is tapped down and they want to move on. Do you have like any incentives to uh, to keep people on? No, actually, I think it's smarter to let them go. Um, and find the next I think one. if you yeah, if you design the system in advance so that you've got a good handbook written out. It, you've got a system for bringing new people on quickly. Then I think it's better to let people go. In fact, I'd actually say this is one of my biggest regrets or lessons learned in hindsight kind of thing about CD Baby is for some people at the company that I really tried to appease and really tried to keep them on and gave them raises and tried to make them happy when in fact they were just ready kind of in a miserable yeah they were in a miserable rut in their life and they were kind of trying to blame me for their rut mm. <laughs> but they were in a rut honestly they should have just left maybe you know everybody's scared to quit their job because they're scared of the next thing and sometimes as the boss manager owner whatever sometimes the best thing you can do for them is to fire them and push them out of the bird's nest as the metaphor goes mm. um design a system where you're able to bring new people in Full of the new people have more enthusiasm, um, more dedication. You, I guess you just have to be aware of when somebody's hit a plateau or a rut, or seems to have just kind of been um, stalled in their progress. If you've got somebody that's awesome and continues to improve and is still, you know, your biggest salesperson or whatever, 
then yeah, you have an incentive to to just keep them happy and keep them on. Um, and then it's just, of course, a matter of talking with them and asking them what they want. There's no set answer that some podcast can give you <laughs> mm, about right. what to do with this person. You just have to ask them. Um, but for everybody else, it's like a non-crucial role. I think it's smarter to just encourage people to either move up inside your company or move on to something else and bring in someone new. Right. Yeah. To have that just philosophy that, you know, we are here to help each other. You know, you help us, we help you, but to the point where we can't help you and, you know, we, yeah, we don't want you to be miserable and we want you to move on have that develop as part of your policy. See, I'm, I'm a yeah. super young company and I just quit my day job about a year and a half ago and uh, last year was the first year. So, like, I'm really bridging that gap where the orders and the labor is out doing what me and my friends can do or my friends stop showing up because, like, look, buddy, I've been helping you a lot in making the salad dressing. <laughs> you know, we got to start making some kind of compensation here. And then you start factoring yeah. all that in. It's like, wow, the numbers completely change. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, it just you got to find where to, to, to have that kind of develop in your philosophy. So is what I did now is I created a, a SOD, a strategic operating document. And that's kind of basically the uh, cookbook, so to say, of the company where every time we do a process more than once, we document it, you know, and that way we yeah. can only build on that process. And when there's someone new coming in, we can just show them the process. We don't have to repeat ourselves. Did That's you, the way to go. That's awesome. I'm curious to see how you, uh, when, when you got to the point when you started building up a bigger team, because I, I have a, I guess, a loaded two-part question. So it's one is, you know, how did you, when, when the company is running very good, how did you find a way to automate that company? And with automation, how do you find ways to systematize sales, marketing, and management? <laughs> okay. Actually, let me answer those in reverse order okay, because... Sure. CD Baby was a bit of a weird case. I don't know if it will help anyone listening, but I didn't do any sales or marketing or management. Mm. <laughs> uh, literally, it, it, I was lucky in that CD Baby just hit at the right time, and kind of like a hit song. Mm -hmm. All I could do was to just deal with the growth. So I didn't have to ever push or promote it or market or I had no salesperson, no marketing person. Um, it just grew like crazy. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I'm no help for that. <laughs> um, but the the first part of your question about bringing new people on, I love that you have this operating document. I think that's awesome. I wish that everybody would do that. It's such a great way to approach your business. Um, I assume everybody's uh, at least heard of and should have read uh, E Myth Revisited by yes, Michael Gerber. One of my favorite books. It's so good. At, yeah, it's so great at, at getting you into that mindset of the franchise prototype, mm -hmm. about making sure that everything's a system. Even a lot of CD Baby was customer service. So imagine this. Yeah, I had 85 employees, 28 of them were customer service, and 50 of them, maybe even like 55, were working in the warehouse, just pick, pack, and shipping CDs into envelopes. Um, so it was, so much of the business was customer service, and so much of the business's uh, success was because of our personal touch, and people loved the way that we communicated in oh-so-friendly way. So for me, it was even systematizing friendliness. Mm. It's like systematizing a philosophy. It was teaching everybody at the company, like, here's the philosophy of what this company's about, what we do, will and won't do. Um, teaching things like, say, um, money back guarantee, right? Like the first time, uh, before I really started to like doing very well, uh, one of the first things that kept coming to me personally a lot was when somebody wanted their money back. So that was actually to me that the the first inspiration for making my kind of employee manual right is is um, saying okay everybody I need to teach you this philosophy okay everybody gather around mm -hmm. instead of sending customers to me for money back um, issues let me teach everybody at the company right now here's my philosophy about money back uh, requests is. Yes, no matter what, no matter what the circumstances are, always give their money back. 
even if we've already done the work, even if we've already shipped the product and it's gone, no matter what, give their money back because they will spread the word that we're a good company and that we we did them right. And at this point, word of mouth is much more valuable to us than the occasional $20 refunded, right? So unless it's clearly a scam, <laughs> which you'll you'll know, it will be overwhelmingly obviously a scam. Unless it's a scam, always give their money back. And I just made sure like everybody in the company understood that philosophy. Hey, Lindsay, could you please open up and text and write that down? Let's make that the first entry in our company philosophy book. Um, that was really useful because then in customer service, you know, I had 28 people that just knew that they could handle anything that came in by themselves without needing to send it to a manager or anything like that. But sorry, rewinding one more step to answer your question though about how I brought new people on, it really helped because it was a team of people doing the same thing because I had 50 people working in the warehouse and 28 people in customer service. Those 50 guys in the warehouse and those 28 people in customer service were all basically doing the same job pretty much. Um, so they could teach each other, which was wonderful. This kicked in after I had about not even two or three people doing any one thing. New hires could just be brought in and the manager really didn't have to do hardly anything more than spend a lunch with them to get to know them a bit. Then they just put them out on the floor and said, okay, guys, here's here's Josh, the new guy. Everybody uh, show him what to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the guys working in the warehouse would be like, all right, dude, here you go. Let me show you how to <laughs> bring in the new incoming orders. Here's how we pack a CD. Here's how we pick it up. And just the existing guys working in the warehouse would show the new guy how to do it. It was an amazing uh, system. It just, especially when we started growing fast, we were having to hire a new person every couple of weeks. It's just an amazing system because then now everybody that got hired also saw how to get trained. And sometimes people that had only been working there for two months were the ones training the new guy. It was awesome. That is interesting, and you s- mentioned that you have a uh, a a philosophy, a customer philosophy book. Is that something like an edible document that you would then go to, and every time y'all had a new update on your philosophy, company vision, you would update that as you go? Yeah, exactly. Um, that's how it was in. Let's say ideally, yes, that's how it was. How it really worked in practice, though. <laughs> kind of more of a grand oral tradition. It's like we did write it down, but for the most part, everybody knew it. Um, We learned things early. You could could kind of refer to our little internal wiki about things and look up stuff. But for the most part, people just started to to get the gist. I think if you communicate the philosophy really well, then the specific action items just flow out of that philosophy. Right. And you said that you didn't have any marketing. I disagree. I think that philosophy right there is marketing. The way that, uh, you know, always make the customer happy, uh, the best customer service, I mean, having almost a third of your employees just for customer service, you know, that that is marketing right there. And if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to read a letter that you changed after someone ordered a <laughs> CD. And I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and I think that's one of the best marketing you know, guerrilla marketing tactics that you can do. Would you care if I read the letter? Yeah, go for it. All right. So, and again, step in. Let me know if I'm wrong. I just kind of found stuff on the internet. So before, when someone would make an order, it would just, an email would go to the customer saying, hey, your order's been shipped, should arrive in a few days. Let us, let us know if it doesn't show up, whatever. And then one day, I don't know what you were drinking, you came up with this, and it's amazing. So after a customer places an order, they get an email that says this. Your CD has gently taken from our CD baby shelves with sterilized, contaminant-free gloves and placed on a satin pillow. A team of 50 employees inspected your CD and polished it to make sure it was in the best condition before mailing. Our package specialist from Japan lit a candle and Hush fell over a crowd as he put your CD into a finest gold lining box that, oh, the finest gold lining box money can buy. We all had a wonderful celebration afterwards, and the whole party marched down to the street to the post office, where their entire town of Portland waved bon voyage to your package, on its way to you and our private CD Baby jet on the day, Friday, June, whatever the day it's supposed to be shipped. 
I hope you had a wonderful time shopping at CD Baby. We sure did. Your picture is on the wall as customer of the year, and we're all exhausted, but we cannot wait for you to come back again to CDBaby.com. Man, I love that. That's marketing, brutal Sorry, marketing all the way. <laughs> that was pretty good. You know what's funny, man? Brilliant. I wrote that like in 15 minutes back mm. in 1998 or something, and... God, what mileage that one email got. I mean, thousands of people posted it to their blog after receiving it. You know, I mean, it went out, I guess, what, 2.5 million times because it would go out at the end of every order. Right. Um, and yeah, thousands of people. If you Google for, if you put in quotes one of those phrases from that letter and Google for it, I found like thousands of people posted it to their blog mm-hmm. saying like, oh, and that. Gee, you wouldn't believe what I just got. This is hilarious. And people would tell their friends about CD Baby because of that shipping email. Yeah, I mean, and, that would just you know, make granted, you smile reading it as customers. Yeah. You know, what what a brilliant way to do it. Yeah, it, I mean, it fit with the tone of the company. I could understand if, you know, a, a doctor's office may not want to do that or something right. like that, the cancer ward. <laughs> but, um, I think almost any business can um can use this example of not needing to do things in an ordinary way. I think that's really a lesson. It's like there's just kind of the normal way that everybody does things, and you don't want to do that. You don't want to be just another company doing it in a normal way. Right. It might be, you know, if everybody's just emailing, maybe you show up in person <laughs> because that's the weird, completely out of the ordinary thing to do. Maybe you uh, call your customers after every single order, even if they don't believe that anymore. Um, whatever that thing may be, you always have to look for what is the thing I could do that would just blow their mind and be completely unexpected and just go above and beyond what anybody would expect from this transaction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just yeah, I, I love it. I think that's brilliant. Uh, uh, another few products that you're working on is Wood Egg Startup. 16 books a year about starting up a business, and you've done it in areas uh, like uh, China, Hong Kong, India, and Indonesia. Let's go on, Thailand, Japan, everywhere. Uh, how did you do that? How, how did you, did you uh, go live in those cities for a long period of time? And would you recommend uh, a city or, or a country for a certain type of entrepreneur, like a, like a startup entrepreneur versus a product entrepreneur? Hmm, good question. Um, actually, you know what? Being the, the podcast that this is with, with your audience, I have to tell you the number one thing that everybody living, every expat living in Asia says is there's no Mexican food. Nowhere in Asia can you find Mexican food. And this just blows people's minds. Like, come on, how hard is it? Like, we've got all the ingredients here. That, I mean, we have... We have ground beef, we have beans, but just nobody's putting them together into the flour or corn shells and making real Mexican food. So if you know how to make Mexican food and you're up for a life adventure, you could move to Asia and <laughs> thrive, I think. Um, okay, so that's well, it. You hear that, um, listeners? There's a challenge right now, so don't say you don't have any business ideas. Seriously. There you go. Uh, I'm just telling you, that's like the, the number one thing that from everybody, whether in Thailand or Indonesia or China or India or Vietnam, there is no Mexican food anywhere here. <laughs> go find three grand, get hint, yourself hint, a food hint. truck, you know, and then go yes. up and down the streets of Hong Kong. Seriously. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I moved to Singapore three years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, so here I am living in Singapore. I It's a tiny little country. I can literally see Malaysia out of my window. And I can see Indonesia out of my window, but I know nothing about these countries. And I wanted to get to know Asia the way I know the 50 states. You know, um, I've never lived in Louisiana, but I know something about it. I've never, sure lived in, uh, yeah, I've never lived in Maine. I've never lived in Arizona, but I know something about these places. Like I, I know something about their culture, a little bit about the history, the geography, the people. Like I just wanted to understand Asia the way I understand 50 states. So, um, yeah, sitting in a hotel room in Indonesia while backpacking through, I said, you know, they say the best way to learn something is to teach it. So mm. I'm going to start publishing a series of books, <laughs> 16 books per year about these 16 countries, and I'm going to redo them every year. And to me, the, the most interesting lesson learned with this, the shareable part, is that um, 
he was kind of a decision up front that these these won't be good at first. Like, I'm going to start out in the first year. They won't be very good, but they'll exist. I will have officially begun. <laughs> and then I can start the annual improvement process. It's like, first, let me just do whatever it takes to just get these out there. So I went to elance.com and odesk.com, and I just hired some researchers, some writers, and some editors, and paid them a little something just to meet some basic bare bones requirements to just get it done so I could say I did it. Mm. And I did it. And last year, a year ago, I put out 16 books, um, and they weren't very good, <laughs> just as planned. But I had done it. I had gotten over that hump. I had launched, you know, and that's huge. That's don't underestimate how many people like just never get to launch point. You know, they just get so paralyzed in their planning and their perfection and all that that they never actually launch something. I, so I completely agree. Uh, if I can just add one thing too, yeah. like I, I've ha felt the same thing with with starting a business, with quitting my job, with writing a marathon. Uh, I rode rode my bike 150 miles, and I've never been prepared for any of these things. The it has never lights have never been green. It was just my mm -hmm. thing is a deadline. I put it in the calendar. Yeah. I said, all right, next year, yeah, I'm gonna quit my job. I'm gonna make salad dressing, and then sure enough, literally, I was still second guess myself a week before it. I'm like, ah, screw it. I said I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it, <laughs> and that's yeah. what it was. It was just a hard deadline. Um, but yeah, it will never things will never be perfect unless you just do it. Yeah, and there's there's really something to be shown as a survivor. Um, if you put something out there, anything, even if it's bad, then you've already kind of bested the 95% that never get to that point, right? It started. Yeah, and then you can begin improving it. And then you're even kind of building your status as a survivor, that if you commit to this constant improvement of whatever you've got then now you can show more longevity and be around for a few years and show that you've been out for a few years and improving versus the person that may be kind of sitting in their bedroom quietly hatching their plans, trying to launch three years from now and be perfect at launch. Mm -hmm. Well, by the time their massive three-year plan launches, you've already been out there in the public eye uh, with real customers telling you what they really need for three years. And you're known and, as the expert now. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, so that's what I did with these series of books that you can see at woodegg.com. If you have any interest in any country in Asia, um, this is the second year uh, the books are out now and they're getting very good. <laughs> is there Once a New I Zealand out, book coming out? No. <laughs> uh, they were just kind of, I'm just in New Zealand for now, but I'm still a... a an official legal resident of Singapore. I, I'm a permanent resident. It's like having a U.S. green card. So I'm a, a real resident of Singapore, and I love it. But, um, uh, yeah, so um, the books are getting quite good, and I'm going to do them again this year, and next year they'll be very good, and hopefully in another two or three years they'll be awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. And another thing, too, I like to mention on the website, which I, uh, I'm a big advocate of reading, is your uh, project Book Notes, which is detailed notes from books that you've read. And uh, I appreciate that. You know, I, I, I take notes kind of as I read, too, on the, on the computer, on a phone, not nearly as detailed. There's been numerous times where someone's like, hey, man, go check out this book. I'm like, well, let me see if Derek already did. <laughs> I'll, show, yeah. I'll go read your notes. I'm like, yeah, I read it. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> that was a good one. So, uh, yeah, that is a great resource, I think, for any entrepreneur is to just, you know, see your thoughts on a few of these books. Thanks. And, and actually, to be clear for the listeners listening, now, he, he's talking about that's on my personal website on Sivers.org, mm -hmm. not on Woodig.com as a separate thing, but on Sivers.org. Uh, I think there's a section there you can find on the homepage called Book Notes. So, yeah, every, every book I read for the last five or six years, I started doing this. Um, every book I read, I give a little one to 10 rating, like how much I would recommend to others. And it's sorted with my top recommendations at the top of the page. So if you just go to my book notes page, sivers.org slash book, you can see my top recommendations at the very top and then detailed notes on every book. And we'll link all that up to the show notes to make sure people can just click away to it. Cool. Uh, so let me ask you, uh, outside of coming up with 16 books a year and you know starting and selling companies and automating them to where you only work four hours every six months, uh, what do you like to do outside work, outside the office? 
in New Zealand. Uh, however, <laughs> not much. Uh, I'm I'm quite a workaholic and always have been. I mean, it's. I think when you find something you love doing, it's not really work. You know, I think there's a few quotes around that. You know, find a great job and you'll never work a day in your life. All that kind of thing. Um, that's how I feel. I, I wake up at 5 or 6 a.m. and start doing what I do, and I often work till midnight, and I love it. Mm-hmm. That said, we had a baby two years ago, so that's the reason we're down in New Zealand now is uh, I know too many people anymore. I have too many friends that wanted to uh, hang out all the time and many conferences and, and universities that wanted me to come speak. It was getting so hard to say no five times a day to everybody, so I came down here to New Zealand. So I, Yeah, and they won't bother I, every, you. Yeah, exactly. I don't know anybody down here. So every non-working minute is basically spent with my little baby. Uh, that's just a, a blast. That's a great perspective. Uh, yeah, that way you can just focus on what it is that you're working for, you know, without all, all these yeah. distractions and other things like people calling you up to do podcasts and stuff like that. So, <laughs> Which I do appreciate <laughs> yeah, you for this. Uh, well, honestly, I like doing things like this too because they're. I enjoy – writing and in fact you know I, i'm making that even more important in my life um sharing what i've learned it's one of those things i don't know blame parenthood or blame a, a couple good friends of mine that have died recently and thinking about how important it is to share what you learn along the way so doing podcasts like this it, it's kind of it helps me it helps me share what i've learned and it also i really appreciate your your questions and the things you toss my way um because it makes me think about some things I never thought about before. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, and so next one, too, is a loaded question. What's a book, a song, and a quote you love? Not necessarily for business, just personally, or business, whatever. Yeah. Um, sorry, you said book, quote, and song? Correct. Okay. Book, let's say... Um, I'm actually going to go with a a new one. I, I was very tempted. Like, actually, my go-to book is um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Mm. I think that that's actually, even though it's legendary and a massive bestseller, I think it's still underrated because of its horrible title. <laughs> I think its title makes it sound like a conniving, slimy book about how to get one over on people. But... Mm. I think it really should have been titled How to Be Considerate. I think it's really the best book ever about thinking of things from the other person's point of view. And um, uh, and that's the essence of everything. That's like all marketing, all business, all communication comes from thinking of things from the other person's point of view. Mm-hmm. That's really the root of everything. So I think that How to Win Friends and Influence People – Dale Carnegie is like the best book on marketing and perhaps business ever written. So that's my my main one. But that said, I want to um, – I'm pulling up the exact title of a book that I think really changed my life a lot that I highly recommend. And it's called uh, A Guide to the Good Life, The Ancient Art of Stoic Joy by William Irvine. Um, you know, I was never into philosophy. I don't care what – Socrates or Immanuel Kant said at some point hundreds of years ago, who cares? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> but, then, but then I read this book, and even though it's talking about, you know, something called a philosophy with a capital P from 600 BC, it was jaw dropping in its kind of uh, guide for a very, very interesting way of thinking life, of life that just really, really resonates with me. And and even if you consider yourself, or especially if you consider yourself the kind of person that wouldn't read a book like this, I highly recommend it. Uh, a Guide to the Good Life by William Irvine. Um, quote, uh, let's just pick one off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> I don't know who it's credited to, but whenever you are not practicing someone somewhere else is practicing and when you meet him he will win wow Mm. (laughs) i love that like that that kept me going through music school whenever i'd feel like a little lack of motivation i remember that kind of reminds me of something mark cuban said too um something like you know 
however hard you're working, there's someone else working harder than you or something like that, you know? Yep. And it just kind of, it, it's one of those things that lights a fire in your ass. And it's so true uh, with competitors, yeah. uh, you know? It's just, I don't like looking at, at competitors and keeping up with their going, but at the same time I do because it keeps me going. It puts that fire in my ass and it makes me move. <laughs> like, oh, I got this. Yeah. You know, let me innovate. Let them copycat. I don't care. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. I think yeah, competition can be a really healthy thing. Um, and yeah, that, that can really help. So yeah, whenever you're not practicing, someone somewhere else is practicing. And when you meet him, he will win. I just love that. Okay. And as for a song, here's my top recommendation is to listen to a song that you think if it's in a genre that you hate. I, I love this. I love listening to something that I think I'm going to hate or in a genre that I've already decided in advance I hate, whether it's opera or whatever, and to listen to it more than once, preferably more than twice, mm. and find something to love about it until you like get over the initial um, kind of womp of dislike by not being used to a genre. Get past that. And get into it. And God, some of my favorite music now is, is music I used to hate. I just kind of grew to love because I just decided myself to give it a chance. So what's your favorite opera song? <laughs> is, is it <laughs> opera? Is that what you've been listening to lately? Or? <laughs> no, actually I've been listening to Klezmer uh, a lot. A lot of Klezmer. A lot of um, Dean Classical music. Right. And... Um, a lot of big band jazz, mm. which I always thought was kind of cheesy, but um, that's what I've been listening to. Every morning I wake up with the baby and we kind of listen to a couple hours of music while making breakfast and hanging out. So that's, that's cool. my main time to sit. To um, I, I, yeah. One quick question I want to ask you too that I just thought of. Uh, you know, what's your take on, just real quick, what's your take on Pandora? Now that they have the music, radio, internet, streaming all the time. Is that a good thing or what's your take on that? <laughs> well... Trick question. One of the downsides of living outside the U.S. is there's some things I can't do, like Pandora. Amazon and Pandora. So oh, okay. <laughs> moving to Singapore is like the main thing I missed. Like every now and then people would say, so what do you miss about the U.S.? And they assumed I was going to say, you know, in and out Burger or something. Mm. And I'm like, no, Amazon. <laughs> I, I, being in the U.S., you take it for granted that any time you want to buy anything, you can just go to Amazon, type it quickly, look at some comparative reviews, find the lowest price on earth and, and click it. And it shows up at your door in a couple of days. It's amazing. And I'm, like, I'm the worst. I like order toilet paper. And my wife is like, why do you ship pens to the house? I'm like, because when I'm at the store, I won't remember. I just, on my phone, boom, done. It's here. <laughs> <laughs> now imagine life without Amazon. Oh and, God, uh, that's a hard one. Yeah. It's, it's been really, uh, it's been really rough, man. <laughs> but yeah. uh, same with Pandora. I used to listen to Pandora a lot. In fact, check it out, man. Pandora used to have an option where you could pay them like 10 bucks and they would disable advertising forever. Right. And I actually paid that to them back in like 2006 or something. So still my Pandora account has no advertising on it, which is pretty cool. And I think they removed that option or something. It but, is. I think it's like $3 um, a month forever. So you got a good deal there. Is it? Okay. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, but I haven't listened to Pandora in a few years and I stopped paying attention to what they're doing because – can't listen to it without yeah. a VP well, bunch you, of stuff that's not You were perfect. mentioning uh, exploring different genres, and Pandora has really yeah. done that for me. Like sometimes I'll just put in uh, a song that I like, and I'll find another th two or three artists that I love that I've never heard of. And so I thought it was an interesting way for me to explore music because I guess I'm not good at selecting music. Uh, but I do like Pandora selecting it sometimes. <laughs> they put up some good ones. Yeah. I love that too. So uh, one last question. Uh, what's next and where can people find you? Um, what's next is breakfast. It's morning here in New Zealand. Um, where people can find me is sivers.org. Uh, really that's my personal, completely non-commercial website. No ads, no nothing, no, not trying to upsell you anything. It's just my website where I like to just share what I've learned. So if you go to sivers.org, S I V E R S dot org. I put my email address in big letters at the bottom because uh, I like getting emails from strangers. I like getting random questions by email, and I put aside a few hours a day to just help and answer those. So, anybody listening to this, if you have any questions at all, 
just drop me an email. Uh, Derek at Sivers.org goes to me, and I'm happy to help. That's very humble of you to do that, Sue. I was shocked, actually, when I uh, got, a, got an email back so quickly from you. Uh, I do appreciate that, and I uh, respect you for putting that on social networks as well. Big and bold. Hey, I don't check Facebook. <laughs> email me. I'm like, whoa, he's putting his email oh, you all saw over that. the internet. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I do respect you for that. That's, that's really humbling. You know, as One inbox. Jeez. How many emails do you get a day? A thousand? Two? Uh, uh, no, 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 like somewhere between 50 and 100, but I can handle it. And I just, Jeez. it's nice having one in inbox. I don't check, you know, Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and all these places with inboxes. I just ignore those and that I just smart, check my email man. every day. That's good. Yeah. Hey, Derek, thanks so much for being on the show, man. Enjoy your breakfast. I really appreciate you sharing all the information, the words today. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks, Richard. I appreciate it. You can find this interview online with topics, quotes, and links uh, from our conversation at thedocast.net. Hat tip to Derek. Check out his website, Silvers. S- I'm sorry. What's S I V E R S? Dot org? Is that yep. what it was? Sorry. And yep. uh, our sponsor, <laughs> Hanley's Foods. Uh, Hanley'sFoods.com. If you'd like to show, please do me a favor and head over to iTunes. Leave us a, a review. It really helps us out. This is Richard and Derek signing out. Thanks. Do it big. <laughs>